Good evening. Welcome to the Essex County Ornithological Club Meeting and Speaker Series. I'm Constance Lapete, I'm president of the ECOC. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. If you are here on a quest for owls, you who have come to the right place. The ECOC and the Peabody Essex Museum are going to be joining Mark and Marsha Wilson and we'll embark on a quest to meet our nighttime neighbors. But first, we're gonna have a brief ECOC meeting. So some housekeeping. Welcome to the third ECOC meeting that's online. Uh, I really appreciate all of the feedback that you have provided. Uh, we will be trying to make this a more clubby and chummy atmosphere like we once had pre-pandemic. But for tonight, we have so many people interested in owls that I'm afraid we had to stick with a webinar platform. So I'm going to ask you, as usual, if you have any announcements or if you have any bird sightings. And if you do, please type them into the chat box and I will do my best to convey the information that you want to provide. And hopefully in the future, we'll have something a little more shared on a different platform. Now, if you're having technical difficulties, uh, please use the question box and post your question. We, as always, are fortunate to have support uh, from Mark Wood at Peabody Essex Museum. You can also email him. That's probably the best thing to do at mark underscore wood at pem.org. That's if you're having any technical difficulties. Hopefully you're not. So some announcements. Uh, the speaker series will continue on Friday, December 4th with lifelong birder and expert bird photographer, Jared Kyes. He'll take us birding in sunny Southeast Arizona. Please come along and bird with your friends. You don't need to be tested for COVID. You don't need to quarantine. It's gonna be warm and sunny. Uh, doesn't that sound awesome? We'll meet right here again. The presentation will be at 7.45, right after a brief ECOC meeting at 7.30. And again, that's December 4th. Some other announcements. Uh, I know the Christmas bird count is coming up and Robert Buxbaum, who is the coordinator for Cape Ann, wanted me to remind you, uh, it's De December, Sunday, December 20th but the count off is gonna be moved to Monday, December 21st, when we count up all of our treasures at the end of the day. Uh, again, Robert Buxbaum is the coordinator. If you are interested in participating in this storied and important citizen science uh, event, uh, please reach out to him. You can reach him at rbuxbaum at gmail.com. That's R-B-U-C-H s-b-a-u-m at gmail.com and of course uh covid guidelines like social distancing and masks will be required but it'll still be fun so consider signing up also i heard from mary margaret halsey who's on the friends of the park river national wildlife refuge council and they are going to give the super bowl of birding a run for its money. Um, the Friends of Parker River are organizing a winter birding challenge that'll be held from February 14th through the 20th next year. Um, it's similar to the Joppa Flats competition, but it, the birding has to happen on Plum Island. Registration fees will raise money to support the Friends Internship Fund, which provides students interested in wildlife conservation and environmental education with paid opportunities to work with refuge staff. That sounds like a great cause. So I hope you'll look into it. You can find information on the Friends website, uh, parkerriver.org. And I'm gonna check the chat to see if we've got some more announcements. Uh, Robert is correcting me. Oh. I'm sorry, his email has an N in it, uh, rnbooksbaum at gmail.com if you're interested. And he's also asking that I mention the Newburyport Christmas count. Uh, that is going to be the following Sunday, 
December 27th. And if you're interested in participating in that one, which will also be on Plum Island, you can contact Tom Young. Now, if you need anybody's email address, you can find mine on the ECOC website and I'll put you in touch with the coordinators. And does anybody else have any more announcements? I'm not seeing anything else in the chat box for events. Uh, I'd like to pass you over to Janie. I believe you had an announcement tonight, Janie. Yes, um, I actually wanted to share some news. Um, many of you old timers anyway with the club will recognize this woman. This is Sally Ingalls. And I recently learned from fellow club member Janet Nussman that Sally died in September, just two weeks shy of her 104th birthday. Sally was one of the first women to join the club in 1955 and was elected its first woman president in 1977. She was also a former natural history curator at PAM and my mentor. According to her daughter, Sally was very much herself right up to the end. Uh, her ashes will be brought from Florida to Robert Ingalls Preserve in New York, which was named in memory of Sally's son and who shared in her passion for nature and the joy of sharing it with others. In this picture um, that I'm with Sally, uh, she's 97 in this picture out in Slingerlands, New York, when I got to see her, which was my last chance to uh, see Sally. So an icon has passed. Um, and, and she really impacted a lot of people. Thank you. Thank you, Janie. I wish I'd known her. Yeah, she was really quite a lady. Uh, I'd like to uh, then introduce Buffy, our treasurer, for the treasurer's report. Um, thanks. I'm Buffy Pennock. I am the treasurer for the ECOC. So thank you and welcome to returning members and members to be. Um, I'm happy to say that we're having a nice healthy start for our membership this year. We've had 30 new, 39 people renewing their memberships since the season began. Um, and if you're wondering how to renew your membership, you can email me at buffypanic at gmail.com and I can let you know if your membership's do's or do, or you can go onto our website by Googling ECOC homepage, uh, website, wait, webpage, ECOC webpage. That'll work. <laughs> and you can find out ways to um, either email me or you can download the form and mail it to me um, at my home and um, we can get you signed up as members. Thank you. Thank you, Buffy. <laughs> And uh, as, as uh, Buffy mentioned, um, we've had a healthy year, but uh, we really appreciate you joining. If you like what you see tonight, uh, your dues would help support presentations like these. And it's ridiculously inexpensive at uh, $12 a person and $15 a household. So please consider it. So now on to some more exciting stuff and that is bird sightings. I would like to know what everyone is seeing out there um, if you've been seeing any good birds, please share by putting it in the chat. Um, I'll start off by saying that just a couple of weeks ago in the Putnam Reservoir, we had quite a wonderful showing of many different kinds of ducks. And if you get bored looking at the ducks, there were pipits floating around in front of you and even a meadowlark. Um, it's a great year so far for winter finches. Uh, erupting south, coming to visit us, red poles, reports of pine siskins everywhere, evening gross beaks are around and I'm still looking for one. And then of course the scop are showing up and the scoters are showing up. Uh, King Eider reported in Revere as well as Plum Island to some lucky few. So uh, definitely a good time to get out there even though it's turning into winter. So I'm checking out the chat box and let's see what people are seeing. Uh, I do see, oh, Nancy Morgan is reporting many evening gross speaks at the feeder in South Salem that I'm so jealous. Uh, Louise Snow is reporting a barred owl in Concord. Oh, they're coming in fast and furious. Flickers in the backyard from Kathleen Smith. 
Oh, snowy owl at Quabbin last Saturday. I can hardly keep up. My goodness, there's a lot of you out there birding and that's really exciting. I'm sorry if I can't read everything that you're reporting. Um, let's see, Harlequin duck, Harlequin ducks at Andrews, good. All is well with the world when the Harlequins show up. Sissy Foliot is reporting small flocks of house and goldfinches and pine siskins at her feeder and a raven. Uh, black scoters, surf scoters, white wing scoters, bald eagle, reasonably regular at Wenham Lake, says Robert Buxbaum. Sandhill cranes headed south near in WI from Chris Matter. Well, that might not be in Massachusetts, but that's okay. Uh, wow, it goes on and on. I'm so happy to see owls reported great horns, ring neck pheasant and wall fleet, and Nelson Sparrow and Lynn. I'm going to have to, I'm afraid, stop there. Uh, this is so exciting. I want to run out the door and start birding. Um, so thank you all for uh, sharing what you're seeing. And you know, there's other vehicles to do that as well. I can't announce them all, but post a mass bird, put it on eBird, and hopefully we all get to share what you're seeing. Thank you so much. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Don Paul. She's going to share with us a book of the month. Hi, everybody. Nice to see every, so many people tonight. So the book of the month uh, for this month is A Field Guide to Your Own Backyard by John Hanson Mitchell, who uh, for many years was a writer and editor with uh, Massachusetts Audubon. And I have a whole shelf full of um, these kind of books that are very local, very specific uh, to New England. And um, I really like them for many reasons. And, and this is one of my favorites, the nice gray fox on the cover. Um, guides sometimes, you know, guides are wonderful to have, but particular field guides can be difficult if you're dealing with something that you're not familiar with. Like I don't know spiders very well. Um, so it's hard for me to use a field guide to pick them out. I don't know the different families and things like that. Um, and so most of these books, and probably all of them, these local guides are organized seasonally. So generally we know what season we're in and that makes a good starting point. And you're also, another reason I like them is you're not just getting individual species, um, which are nice to have. Um, it's wonderful to see something new, but you get a real sense of um, the common birds in your area so that when something different does show up, you know, you really know that you've got something to look at. Um, and, but it's not just the species, but you get a nice rhythm of what's really going on right outside your own windows, um, you know, through the seasons. And like in, in my area, which is the North Shore, um, when I see the, uh, you know, I look up some, you know, afternoon and realize that the chimney swifts are no longer flying around. Um, I realize that, you know, summer's definitely over. Um, so you, you can have all these different markers for the seasons based on the natural world that you can share with your family and your neighbors. So get yourself a backyard field guide if you don't have one yet. Don, thank you so much. What a great idea. I know we're all spending a little more time wandering around our house and our backyard, so it'd be nice to have some uh, books to help us understand what's going on out there. Thank you, and uh, I know you guys are all hooting for owls and hollering at this point. So I am going to introduce Janie Winchell, who is going to introduce tonight's speakers and the owls. Janie is the ECOC VP and Director of the Art and Nature Center at the Peabody Essex Museum. Janie? Thanks, Constance, and welcome owl enthusiasts. I am Janie Winchell and the Sarah Fraser Robbins Director of PAMS Dottie Brown Art and Nature Center, as Constance mentioned, as well as the club's program coordinator. I am really excited to welcome back Mark and Marsha Wilson for another joint ECOC and PEM event. The last time we hosted them was back in 2004 for a fabulous talk on the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. Tonight's OwlQuest event is based on Mark's award-winning book, Owling, 
and is made possible by a generous gift from Joni and Tim Ingram in memory of Dottie Brown, beloved member of ECOC, longstanding PEM honorary trustee, and a benefactor of the Art Nature Center. Uh, Mark and Marsha founded Eyes on Owl in 1994 as an educational enterprise to bring wild owls to schools and other groups to help people learn about these secretive nocturnal neighbors and their habitats. Their team of owl ambassadors are all permanently disabled, non-releasable birds that wouldn't survive in the wild. Mark is an award-winning wildlife photographer with an esteemed career as a former photojournalist and newspaper columnist at the Boston Globe. Marsha is a talented naturalist and educator. Together, they have done presentations about owls for literally thousands of people, both in person and now via live stream events from their home roost in Dunstable, Mass. Before I turn the screen over to Mark and Marsha, I want to remind you to post your questions, ideally in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. We'll get to as many as we can at the end of the program. Now, please join me in giving a warm virtual welcome to Mark and Marsha. Thanks so much for joining us. Ooh, 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 ooh. Ooh, 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 ooh. That's the sound of one of our neighbors. Maybe a sound you're familiar with. But if you woke up in the middle of the night and outside your bedroom window, you've heard that. Ooh, 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 ooh. That's a great horned owl. Good evening. We're going to go on a quest for owls here. They're highly sought after birds, and most people never get enough sightings of them and we're going to have a fun time tonight questing for owls so i am going to jump right into the slideshow and uh mark i need to see how to share my screen here yeah so uh, you need to go down to the bottom of the zoom window okay i got it yeah cool, yeah thank you okay and uh do desktop one and then share desktop and then share. Okay. And now just click play in your keynote and you're good to go. Okay. And you're going to blow that up full screen for me. Thank you. You're all full screen. All right. Well, we're going to go looking for 19 different owl species. That's how many breed in North America, north of Mexico. And it's going to be uh, a fun journey. And then we're going to wind up the program meeting six live owls after the slideshow. And we will take questions after the slides as well. So during the program, hold on to your questions and we will try to get to everyone's. But Marsha and I have spoken now to more than half a million people. And uh, this is really our life. It's a life decision to uh, keep owls. Some of them live 50, 60 years potentially. So it's a long term commitment. But Marsha, started out doing these owl programs at schools while I was working at the Globe. And she instantly had these kids in her hand when she would bring out a snowy owl or any screech owl or any of the other owls that we use for education. And, you know, owls are hard to find. If you're a beginning birder or you're a photographer wanting to get pictures of owls, you're going to find that owls are a difficult subject. They're hard to find. You often will hear them but not see them like these long-eared owls, these are in a communal roost, and we'll more on that in a few minutes, but they're riveting. They have these big eyes, they have a big head, forward-facing eyes, and they sometimes turn up at the least expected times. And to see some of these owls, you don't have to travel. They might even be in your neighborhood or even in your yard. And we're gonna talk about how you can maybe find them. But my chore was to find all 19 species for the book to photograph, and some of them I've been photographing for years, for decades even, but a few of the Western species I had to make special trips to try to see. Now, I should mention that snowy owls have just started showing up in New England. Uh, there was a sighting down in Chatham, the one out of Quabbin, and then also um, up in Hampton Beach uh, State Park in uh, New Hampshire. And so there's snowy owls are showing up. There's a lot of them up in the Montreal region right now, but we'll talk about their eruptive migration in a moment. But no matter what owl you're looking at, 
They grab your attention. More on this picture in a few. All right, so this is this was what happened. I, for years, had photographed owls, and I needed in my mind to do a book, but I had never got down to do it. And then one day, a friend of ours, Claire Walker Leslie, said to me, Mark, you need to do an owl book. And she made an introduction to her editor, and I came away from that meeting with a book contract. But suddenly, gulp, I realized I didn't have pictures of six species of the 19 that nest in North America. So I had to go on an owl quest to find those other species. Now, we'll start off with some of the birds that I've photographed right locally. And these are birds that many of you have probably seen or maybe heard. But the Eastern Screech Owl is one of my favorites locally. And this little screech owl was key teed up in a, uh, in a maple tree in a hole that was shaped like a peanut. So I started to call this screech owl Mr. Peanut, but then when another screech owl came in and mated with Mr. Peanut, I realized Mr. Peanut was Mrs. Peanut. So Eastern screech owls show up in suburbs, in urban areas. Um, you don't have to be way out in the sticks to see one. Uh, they have them in Boston, Mount Auburn Cemetery in Cambridge, where this picture was taken. Um, it's just a matter of slowing down and paying attention to cavities where these birds tend to roost. And as you can see, they come in the, those two colors, the red and the gray. Now, screech owls eat not only rodents, but a lot of insects. And here we have a screech owl with a moth in its beak. And here we have a screech owl chick getting ready to launch from its birdhouse. And birdhouses designed for screech owls are very effective. You can easily get one of these owls potentially to move into your neighborhood or yard, either to roost or to nest. And how cool would that be? And if you turn the box so it's facing your house or apartment, you can monitor the box and you might have two babies peeking out of the hole like we have here, both red screech owls, Eastern screech owls. Or you might even see some cool things like the parents delivering a mouse and here's the baby ready to eat that mouse, white footed mouse. Now, once they leave the nest, these little babies, these chicks can't fly too well yet. So if you find them on your lawn, you don't wanna to try to rescue them, just let them be. The parents are still with them. They'll flap climb up a tree and get out of danger. And uh, already at this age, you can see the left one is red and the right one is gray. If you look at the facial disc, you see the difference in colors. Now, after the kids are all grown up, the adults go back to roosting in cavities and trees. And now is a good time to look for them roosting on a nice warm day in the winter. You might see them teed up in a cavity, peeking out, sunbathing. And that's how often I'll find screech owls in the winter. Of course, in the summer, you almost never see a molting screech owl, and that's perhaps they're, because they're embarrassed. When you look at this little red screech owl, you just feel for him. This little, it's a female actually, she knows that she doesn't look her best with all those pin feathers coming in. So she's molted her head feathers and growing the new feathers on top of the head there. Now here's an owl. At times, it's the most common owl in Massachusetts. And right now, that's probably true. In migration, fall migration, Hundreds of screech um, sawwood owls come through northern New England, and they headed south. And on a on a good evening, a branding station may ban thirty or forty or fifty sawwood owls in one night. So at times they're the most common owl in Massachusetts. But go out into the woods and try to find one. Good luck. They're a tough owl to find. This one was photographed in a spruce tree in Ontario. And once you do find a sawwood owl, they usually will sit there if you're quiet and you don't approach too closely. All right, here's an owl that most of us have heard and probably most of us have even seen. It's the barred owl, eight note call. Ooh, 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 ooh. Who cooks for you? Who cooks for you all? And the barred owl is a cavity nester generally, which means they nest in holes and trees like this female is doing. And here's the male and female together taking a break from the kids. Usually the females are larger. Although in this picture, they're pretty similar in size, but I think the bird on the right is probably the female, but I can't say for certain, they look very similar. And here's a barred owl flying in its prime habitat, mixed woods, deciduous woods with some pine. Um, this was photographed in Nashua, New Hampshire. And barred owls are probably the first owl I remember hearing as a kid when I was camping in the White Mountains. 
But like the screech owls, you can attract them to nest in your area by putting up a box for them, like you see in this picture. Here we have a chick peeking out of the box and another chick up above there just fledged, leaving the box. And here's the chick's first flight. I waited three days to see this happen. And you know the chick gave several false starts over the first two days. And finally it committed and jumped and leaped and out it went and it quickly plummeted to the ground, which is not uncommon, and ended up on a little stick. And then it decided that was a dangerous place to be. So it quickly flat climbed up a nearby tree where it promptly found a safe spot to sit. And it was happened to be blending in perfectly with the bark. So these little owls, they can't fly well yet, but they can certainly climb really well and they'll get off the ground to stay out of danger. Here's a blue jay um, mobbing a barred owl. And you know, you can often find owls if you listen to chickadees and titmice and nuthatches and blue jays, because when those birds find owls, they will mob them. And you can often locate an owl just based on the alarm calls of these small birds. All right, here's a barred owl hunting in a snowstorm. Some winters, they, um, they wander into cities even, uh, but most barred owls aren't going to be nesting in urban areas. But uh, on some winters, we get big movements of barred owls, especially when rodent populations are low. And that happened a few winters ago. I think it was two winters ago. Barred owls were showing up starving in a lot of locations. Uh, rodent population had crashed. Okay, here's a rare owl in Massachusetts, the barn owl. It's state listed, which it means it's on the endangered species list of special concern. And um, finding a barn owl on the mainland is pretty hard. If you go down to Florida or Texas or, Flo or Cal California, where I did, um, you'll find lots of barn owls. But here in Mass, your best bet would be out in Martha's Vineyard. But it's a tricky owl to locate. Um, they're pretty nocturnal. Um, and you don't really want to go into their barn because if they're roosting, you'll, you'll disturb them. So it's a tricky bird to observe uh, without disturbing it. But they are a beautiful owl, uh, one of the most beautiful owls in the world. They're found all over the world, every continent except Antarctica. And barn owl uh, is just a, an astounding bird. It's like looking at the night sky when you look at the bird's back. Now, barn owls got their name because they often nest or roost in barns, but prior to European settlement of North America, there were no barns. So barn owls often nest in caves or overhanging uh, berms on cliffs. And uh, that's where you would find them historically. Um, I went out to California to photograph barn owls because I knew that vineyards out there had put up boxes for them. The, the wine vineyards um, had hundreds of barn owls nesting out there. This is in uh, Northern California, unfortunately where they've had recent fires. But this is a typical vineyard scene with a barn owl nesting box there and you have a barn owl peeking out, another one up on top. And these barn owls perform a great service to the grape growers. They eat uh, gophers and mice that would damage the roots or damage the irrigation lines. And the farmers that put up these boxes don't use chemical poisons. So at dusk, I had hundreds, well, not hundreds, I had scores of barn owls um, screeching and flying around and it was just an amazing scene in this particular vineyard where I was working that evening. Great horned owl, Marsha. Well, the great horned owl is well-named. It has big feather ear tufts and it's our largest resident owl here in Massachusetts. Um, they will hunt during the day when they have chicks. Uh, they use old stick nests from other birds like great blue herons or ospreys or even a squirrel's nest occasionally. Um, a hawk's nest is a favored nest, red-tailed hawk nest. Here's a great horned owl in an old great blue heron nest with two chicks peeking out. Here's the adult male nearby keeping a wary eye on me. I shot this from a kayak using a 800 millimeter lens. So I always use telephoto lenses to stay away from my subjects so I'm not disturbing them. And that's the key. If you're gonna photograph owls, you need to invest in a telephoto lens and then you'll get some natural behaviors. Here's a great horned owl preening. Uh, this is the female right above the nest and she had had enough of the kids. And so she decided to take a me break and she's preening her tail. Can you figure out where her, her, her eye and her beak are in that picture? It's kind of tricky. It would make a devilish jigsaw puzzle, I think. And sometimes in the woods in May, you may see this scene, late April, early May, uh, young great horned owls are out of the nest. They can't fly too well yet. We call them branchers at this stage. And 
there they are on a branch as advertised and they can't really get away. So I quickly moved in for a close up and then backed off to let the parents continue to care for them and feed them. All right, well, snowy owls are arriving as we speak. Highly sought after bird, both for birders and photographers. And they nest in the Arctic. They come down in Massachusetts, usually in November. Occasionally we get them in late October, but this year, the first ones I heard of were showing up in November. Um, they typically cluster near the coast, more so than inland, although we already had that bird show up at Quabbin last Saturday, Quabbin Reservoir, which is inland. Um, but the barrier beach is a classic setting for the snowy owl. Um, and the beach itself is also a place where they'll hunt ducks and gulls. Here's a pellet from a snowy owl coughed up and left on the sand. And you can dissect that to see what they've eaten. And I bet many of you have taken apart owl pellets either in school or camp. Here's one flying over the classic barrier beach setting out on Nantucket during a snowstorm. And here's one up at Rye Harbor State Park. So these owls attract a lot of attention. Most people are pretty respectful, but you don't want to get, try to get too close to these birds and flush them because they'll be burning up calories they can't afford to lose. So if you all you have is a phone, it's not the best tool to photograph a snowy owl. You want to invest in a telephoto lens before you try to get pictures. And that way you can stand away and get close-ups without influencing the owl's behavior. So to work on this book, I had to um, photograph snowy owls at the nest. And to do that, I traveled to the North Slope of Alaska, to the Arctic tundra. Here's a nest with five, a, uh, five young, one's hatched and there's four eggs. You can see the, the egg in the foreground is pipped, ready to hatch. And there's the mother, female snowy owl. She's kind of soiled there, but she's taking care of her three chicks underneath her there. That was taken at about 1 a.m. in the morning. In the Arctic, you have 24 hour daylight in the summer. And here is a behavior shot that I was very happy to get. This is the male on the left, snowy owl, delivering a lemming, a brown lemming, to the female in the center, while the family at the right watches, waiting to be fed. Then that, this is the star of the show here. This is a brown lemming. This is a rodent that snowy owls depend on to nest. If there's lots of lemmings, they'll nest. If lemmings are scarce, chances are the snowy owls won't nest that year. And sometimes the chicks, get big in a hurry. And you can see the size difference here. Look at that chick that's going eye to eye with the female versus that little chick underneath there. And these is a big age difference there. And you can see the size difference is immense. And then once they leave the nest, you'll see them scurrying around on the tundra, perhaps posing near cotton grass like this one's doing. Uh, but they look like little gremlins out on the tundra there. And uh, I worked with Denver Holt, who's a researcher who does a lot of snowy owl research in the uh, in Alaskan tundra. All right, well, Marsha here is scanning the tundra for snowy owls. She's using a spotting scope, which is very valuable when you're trying to find open country owls like snowy owls or short-eared owls. And we use binoculars and scopes a lot. I think photographers maybe fall into the trap of not using binoculars enough or scopes for that matter. But here's Marsha dressed for the evening. She's out scoping muskox and snowy owls and other tundra birds. Um, but we do a lot of observation uh, when we're trying to study these birds and we don't always necessarily take pictures. But when you do find a snowy owl, you feel like you're walking on water, which of course I'm not doing actually here. There's ice underneath that meltwater on top of this, on top of the uh, ice sheet. Well, when I was in Alaska, I had to photograph from a blind and uh, that was so that the snowy owls would have normal behavior that I could photograph and they couldn't see me in the blind. Someone would walk me in, drop me off at the blind and then walk away. Since the owls can't count, they figure there's nobody in the blind. Now, everything's cool because I was set up on a nest, but in the back of your mind, there's always this thought, what if there's a polar bear nearby? And indeed there were polar bears not too far away, but luckily they didn't wander too far inland where I was set up. But polar bears have been known to eat eggs out of birds' nests that are on the ground. <coughs> Excuse me. And this is what a snowy owl thinks of a polar bear eating its eggs, giving it a hard look. All right, well, here's an owl that used to nest in Massachusetts, and I was able to photograph it in Massachusetts at the nest, which I'll show you in a moment. This picture was taken at Plum Island. Plum Island can be a good place to go to look for owls. 
you want a telephoto lens again because a lot of the terrain is closed off to actual walking but from the road you can often observe snowy owls and short eared owls at close range and you're not disturbing them if you stay on the road and use your telephoto lens um, short eared owls don't have much in the way of ear tufts they rarely, rarely can you see them and here's one nesting out on nantucket on, on the uh, heathland sam plain heathland um, they also nest in the sam plain grasslands so it's in the lower left there underneath the bush you can kind of see a cryptic little blob and that's the short-eared owl now they haven't nested probably in massachusetts probably now for maybe 10 years. And so this is a rare photo now. This is a, a prized photo. I took this probably 30 years ago. This is a female uh, short-eared owl on the nest with three chicks with her. And then there's a pile of lemmings at the upper left, um, not lemmings, sorry, bowls. Down here in the South, we call them bowls. Um, and so she's just keeping those young warm and well-fed. And here's the young waking up, yawning on her back. And you can see the little short-eared short uh, feather tufts coming off of her head in this picture, which is not a good field mark, by the way. It's, uh, you rarely see that. All right, well, a lot of people can confuse long-eared with short-eared owls. In flight, they look similar, but the long-eared owl has an orangey face. And a lot of people also confuse long-eared owls with great horned owls. Uh, vocally, they have a single hoot. It's like, woo, woo, but other owls can do single hoots, so it's kind of risky to identify them by voice only. Now, they communally roost in the winter in these big roosts. If you do a quick count here, how many owls do you see? If you said nine or 10, I'd give you a gold star because that's how many are in this picture. Um, it's easy to find six, but finding the last three or four is quite difficult. And underneath this roost, the ground was littered with pellets. It's almost like more pellets than ground showing there. Um, just an amazing sight. Now, here in Massachusetts, we don't get big roosts anymore like we used to, uh, but this particular roost was actually in Eastern Europe. Marsha and I saw 43 long-eared owls in one tree, which is a huge roost. All right, when you're looking for great gray owls, you're gonna see a crowd and not of owls, that is, of photographers and birders. Great gray owls always draw a crowd. This was shot up in Newport, New Hampshire a few years ago when a great gray owl showed up. And great gray owls are really attention getters. This one had some interesting behaviors. It was sitting on a tripod, or it would sit on fence posts or tripods or people's heads, and it would hunt from that post. But this one was sitting on the tripod, and then I noticed it started staring at me and it launched off of that tripod. And I was kind of getting a bit nervous now. I was about 300 feet away, shooting with a 600 millimeter lens. And this bird was inbound. I didn't know what was on his mind, but I was getting kind of nervous. And suddenly I realized he was gonna come in and land on me. And thank goodness I had photographers near me. They captured the moment. The bird landed on my hand, which was resting on my lens. And he sat there for about 45 seconds and then flew off. But the next day I was up there and the bird landed on my lens again and sat there for 45 minutes. Interestingly, three or four weeks prior to that, there was a bird up in Montreal area that was doing the same thing. So I think this may be that same bird. Here we are just getting to know one another. And here we are watching a raven fly over. It's always good to bird watch with a great gray owl. Their eyesight is better than mine, so they pick up stuff more quickly. And I was able to get some beautiful head and shoulder shots from about six or eight feet away. And they have a huge facial disc, which helps them focus sound into their asymmetric ears on their head, and they can hear voles underneath the snow. And that's usually what they're hunting for. Now, if you do have a telephoto lens, you don't wanna shoot tight, tight, tight all the time. You want to back up and get some environmental pictures too to show some habitat. At first, this picture may, you may say, well, where's the owl? And you realize it's sitting there, but it, it's become part of the tree. And this is, I believe is a cottonwood tree. And uh, I love the trees, branches and the lichens. And then the owl is just almost an ornament in that tree, but it's, I think it shows the habitat really well. 
same bird out hunting over a snowy field. And that's not a Photoshop background. That's just a sheet of snow, a plane of snow, which I use to simplify the composition. But these things happen quickly. Great gray owls plunge dive when they're hunting uh, voles under the snow. This is a bird that's going into a plunge and it's listening after it plunged to the vole that's under there that it heard and didn't get right away. And this is what they leave when they do that plunge. It's the original snow angel. So here's Marsha up in Winnipeg looking at in deep snow, it's about two, two feet of powder. This is a uh, great gray owl plunge hole. You can see it goes quite deep. All right, here's a rarity that few of us get to find here in Massachusetts. This is the boreal owl and it's superficially similar to a sawwet owl, but a little bit bigger. And I'll show you how to tell the difference. Boreal owls on the left, and you'll notice the forehead, forehead has spots. The sawwet owl is on the right and you'll notice there are little streaks on the forehead. So if you do find a sawwet owl, give it a hard look and make sure you're looking at streaks on the forehead and not spots. A few years ago, a boreal owl showed up in Topsfield and some of the initial sightings misidentified it as a sawwet owl. In fact, it was a much rarer boreal owl. Unfortunately, it was just a one day wonder and not many people got to see it. Another rare visitor to New England is the Northern Hawk Owl. And I photographed this one though up in Quebec. And I've worked in what, five different uh, provinces or territories to work on this book. Uh, the temperature when I took this was about 25 below zero and my face was starting to freeze to the camera. I almost got some frostbite out of that. But hawk owls are very hawk-like, they're diurnal. They hunt during the day and they're very active and they eat a lot of rodents. And here's a story that the tracks tell. You can see the trail of the rodent through the snow, probably a mouse, maybe a vole. And then it gets punctuated by a plunge hole of a Northern hawk owl coming down and boom, punching the ticket of that rodent. So sometimes I think these little burrows under the snow get so, um, this air gets so bad from ammonia from droppings and whatnot that these rodents have to pop up for fresh air. And that's when the hawk owl would come down and grab them. But they'll also take on bigger creatures like this gray partridge. This was up in, uh, let's see, this was in Minnesota. And this uh, hawk owl grabbed a gray partridge, which surprised me. I'd never realized they would take a bird that big. Now, Marsha and I honeymooned in Churchill, Manitoba. And this is a picture from our honeymoon in 1994. And, uh, and this shows, um, a nesting area of Northern hawk owls. That dead tree at just right of center is a snag where a hawk owl is nesting. This is a burned over area, spruce forest. And there's the top of that burnt snag with uh, six, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six baby hawk owls there waiting to fledge. And here's one that did fledge out of the nest. And this is classic habitat for them. Uh, they'll often, use a snag that's blown over or burnt, burnt and fallen over from the burn. And uh, in Massachusetts, we just don't see them too often. So that's why I had to wander much farther north to find uh, dependable birds to photograph. Burrowing owl. Well, there's two races of burrowing owls. You can either go to Florida or you can head out west to see them. This picture was taken down in Fort Myers. Here's a family of burrowing owls. Um, but for most of my barn owl, burrowing owl pictures, I went out to Arizona. And Arizona is a great place for owling um, if you can stand the heat. You gotta go early. You don't wanna go too late in the spring because it gets really hot quickly. But these burrowing owls are interesting to watch. They have their den, if you will, in the ground or their nest in the ground. Here's a burrowing owl carrying a grasshopper. You can notice the bird's banded. Here's a... Um, male burrowing owl in the foreground out of focus flying in getting ready to feed the three chicks there you can tell they're getting excited and this picture was taken in arizona in july the temperature during the day was 118 degrees so the sand was much hotter and you can bet that that burrowing owl is running across that sunlit sand because it is so hot he's headed for the shade so they do hot foot it across the sand <clears throat> and they try to stay in the shade during the hot part of the day. 
And this young owl at the left was giving me the uh, head cock, wondering what I'm all about. Meanwhile, the bird, the adult at right says, ah, it's just another photographer. I shot this from the car in the evening and the temperature had dropped to a comfortable 100 degrees. Western screech owl, not an owl I've spent a lot of time with, but you'll notice it has a black beak compared to the kind of uh, bone colored beak or olive colored beak of Eastern screech owls, but otherwise they're very similar. And that bird was photographed in Utah in the uh, Wasatch Mountains. Whiskered screech owl has one of the most restricted ranges in the United States. So we had to go to Arizona to pick up a few of the Western specialties. And we went to a place called Miller's Canyon down in Southeastern Arizona, beautiful habitat. And you're looking right up the canyon here in this photo. And you can find in this canyon, uh, five or six species of owls. And this is where I photographed a lot. And we did find whiskered screech owl there. And also we found it, um, in another spot in southeastern Arizona. This is what it looks like. They typically are along rivers at higher elevation than the western screech owl. And this one's looking out of its cavity right along a river uh, down near Portal, Arizona. Northern pygmy owl, also in Miller's Canyon. I happened to luck out and find them. First I heard them one evening and then went back another evening and found a nest. But they have eye spots on the back of their heads and so this is thought that it protects them from bigger predatory birds that might think they're looking at them with those false eye spots uh, on the back of the head. But here's the nest. Can you find it? Give you a second to look. Very camouflaged, that little owl peeking out. It's right in the center there under that broken off limb, there's a little head peeking out and that is a Northern pygmy owl nest. Spotted owl, also in Miller's Canyon. They weren't nesting the year we were there, but this pair was hanging out together, preening each other, just made a wonderful little scene. Was able to capture some lovely photos of them. And you can see they look similar to a barred owl to which they're closely related, but they have spotting on the belly rather than bars and stripes. Flammulated owl, tough owl to find. This was the last one I photographed for the book. And I looked for them in Northern California on nights like this in the Sierra Nevadas, thousands of stars. And I heard the little buggers calling, but I couldn't see them, couldn't find them. So then I then drove east 600 miles to Utah, Salt Lake City. And I hired a guide, an owl guide, because my deadline for the book was looming and I needed to get pictures. And in that one evening, the guide showed me seven different flammulated owls. They have dark eyes. They're the only small owl with dark eyes and you don't get them here in the east. And they're found usually six to 8,000 feet up in the mountains. And they're like little elves, little gnomes. You kind of get this weird feeling when they're looking at you. Um, it's just like you're being watched by an elf in the woods. Speaking of elves, elf owls are typically found in the desert or in arid regions. And here's a Sonoran desert in uh, South Central Arizona. And you can see all the saguaro cactus there. And that's a good place to look for elf owls in cavities made by woodpeckers because that's what they'll use to nest. Here's a little male elf owl peeking out of a cavity in a saguaro. And there's a little closer view of it. And this was in the evening, the bird was getting ready to go hunting. And elf owls eat a lot of insects, a little lizards, and uh, also maybe small rodents, but they eat a lot of insects and lizards. And they'll also have nests in hardwood trees. So it's not just cactuses that you'll find them. Here's a hardwood tree down in a uh, riverine uh, environment in, in southeastern Arizona. This is near Portal. Uh, and this bird's peeking out of its nesting cavity. So quite a look, little different environment than the actual Sonoran Desert here. Now, probably one of the most difficult owls to find other than flammulated owl is the ferruginous pygmy owl. And they have this rust on their back and tail, which that's the ferruginous color. And otherwise they look very similar to a Northern pygmy owl. This one's sitting in a Palo Verde tree uh, down in the desert, the Sonoran desert. And to find this bird, I went out with a researcher whose air study area we were working in. And he was able to show me a nesting site. And I waited there and finally was rewarded with a picture of a ferruginous pygmy owl flying out of the cavity. Not an easy picture to get. Marsha started to overheat. 
had a little uh, heat exhaustion going on. Hot environment, you got to work early so the birds don't get heat stressed. But these are diurnal owls. You can see them during the day actively hunting. So glow in the dark cover on my book. Owling is the book. Um, we have copies available. If you'd like to purchase a copy, you can email us or call us. And uh, I hope you enjoyed the slideshow. Now let's get to the meet the real owls here. Marsha is standing by. Okay. We're gonna start small with a Northern sawwet owl and an Eastern screech owl. <clears throat> And you can tell me whether they're both in the frame there. Yep, looks good. But uh, the softwet is a little bit smaller than the screech owl. And uh, as Mark was saying, they're both cavity nesters. And they're, they're definitely worth putting the time in to try to find. Um, both could, I, could I just interject, Mark? Are we going to show this full screen? Yeah, so you have to reshare your, uh, your screen again. Oh, thank you. It, it it exited out when you uh, closed the uh, point. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> that's not showing, is it? <clears throat> we see the PEM website. Yeah, let me get rid of that, right? So why am I... Uh... Are you going to be showing slides? No, we're done. Okay, I will turn that off and we can see the video. We can see you continue your presentation. Okay. You're all set. Okay. <clears throat> it's still no, not. So we can see your video, so just continue to proceed. Okay. So Marsh is holding uh, a screech owl on the left and a sawwet, northern sawwet owl on the right. And you can see that the screech owl has ear tufts and the sawwet owl does not. And uh, Marsha, you can get a little closer to the camera. Um, and these little owls, even though they're, they're similar size, they look quite different. Um, the screech owl we have out here is a red version. It also comes in gray. And the screech owls are permanent residents, whereas the sawwet owls are migratory. And as I mentioned, they're migrating right now. Um, and they're quite common during migration. Uh, both of these owls eat a lot of the same things, a lot of insects, small rodents. And uh, the screech owl that we have here is a female, although just looking at her, you wouldn't know that. She was part of a scientific study. And uh, when the study ended, uh, they needed to place 86 screech owls, and we adopted four of them. And Marsha, what happened with the sawwet owl? What's the story behind this bird? Well, two years ago, during migration in the fall, this little sawwet owl was found in the middle of the road in Revere. And somebody rescued it. Uh, long story short, made its way through several different hands um, to uh, New England Wildlife Center in Weymouth. And they realized that the bird had a broken right wing and its head was upside down. Mm. <clears throat> its neck was not broken, but its head was upside down. And uh, so. <laughs> Oops, sorry. I just trying to get him to look at the camera there. <laughs> and uh, with, after four months of rehab at New England Wildlife Center, uh, her head returned to the normal position. And uh, they tried to. Uh, repair that right wing. It really didn't work perfectly, so the bird can't really fly normally. But um, other than that, she's just uh, feisty and makes a great education bird. And what's the call of the sawwet owl? So they they toot. They don't hoot. And you can easily just whistle that call and imitate it. Why don't you give it a try at home? Yeah, if you can't whistle, you can go doot, 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 doot. And then the screech owl has a whinny uh, or a trill. And you're born with the ability to trill, unfortunately. And I can't trill, and neither does Marsha. I know there's probably some hotshot birders in the club that can trill. 
and I'm so jealous if you can, but uh, if you can't trill, you can do this call, Marsha. How does it go? The Winnie. Yeah. And um, experienced birders will use the trill to draw in other birds uh, like chickadees and nuthatches and warblers and vireos because when they, when they hear that screech owl trill, they think there's a screech owl in the neighborhood and they'll flock in to mob the so-called owl. And so a lot of birders will use that technique to draw in other birds so they can get a look at them. You don't want to use recordings during the breeding season for playback because that would stress the birds. And also it's not allowed to use recordings in state parks and national wildlife refuges. And you don't want to use recordings in places where a lot of people are around. So if you do use recordings, use it rarely and judiciously like on a Christmas count. But as a general rule, we discourage using playback to attract owls. Now we are licensed by the US Fish and Wildlife Service as well as different state agencies like Mass Wildlife. And we literally have to have separate licenses just across uh, state boundaries. I'm gonna try to get that saw it out and look around here. <laughs> and so it's very tightly regulated in the interest of uh, making sure that the birds are taken care of properly and given pr proper housing. You've probably noticed that the softwood is very, very good at looking over its back. All owls are. And the little red screech owl was one of the first owls that I ever really got to know. When I was growing up, my mom used to do live owl programs for the South Shore Natural Science Center. And several of her screech owls lived in our living room. And uh, there was this one little red screech owl that used to buzz our heads when we'd get up in the morning to go to, sc to school. So uh, we got to know all of those screech owls quite well. She also had a number of softwood owls and uh, they, they were just everybody's favorite. So why don't I go and get a larger owl? Mark will rejoin us here. Okay. Okay. And this next owl is, I'd say screech owls are probably the most common owl in Eastern Mass. This next owl is probably the second most common owl year round in Eastern Mass. And that would be the barred owl. And as we mentioned earlier in the slideshow, they has an eight note call. Sounds like they're saying, who cooks for you? Who cooks for you all? Ooh, 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 ooh. Sometimes they'll drop the first six notes. I just do the you all. Ooh. And they do a blood curdling scream or screech, which when you hear it, a lot of people think they're hearing a fisher in the woods when in fact they're hearing a barred owl. And it sounds like something's getting murdered in the woods. It's pretty scary when you first hear it, particularly if you're laying in your tent alone in the middle of the White Mountains and you're wondering what that is coming towards you, the sound in the woods. But barred owls, we hear them here right where we are in Dunstable. And they, uh, they're they a dark-eyed owl, big round head, almost as big as a great horned owl, but not nearly the same weight. And barred owls are probably the first owl I remember hearing calling uh, in Massachusetts. Now they're, they're found all the way out to Washington state and they're actually in, increasing their range. They're now on Cape Cod nesting and barred owls were absent from the Cape 20 years ago. They were a rare bird out there. Now they're pretty common and uh, they're nesting in many towns. So I am gonna oh, here again, get this bird to look at me and look at the camera. And Marsha, what, how did we acquire this bird? Well, uh, this barred owl was accidentally, of course, hit by a car and was found by somebody somewhere in New Hampshire was brought into a rehab center by the name of Wings in Henniker, New Hampshire. And it had a, a very broken right wing. Uh, the rehabber that runs Wings, Maria Colby, tried to set the wing, but it just wasn't gonna work. So uh, that, that meant that this bird could not be released. And uh, we had had a need for a second barred owl Usually we have two at a time to keep each other company. And uh, so this bird 
rather quickly just learned to sit on the hand and uh, the barred owl gets its name from the bars that are right here that run from shoulder to shoulder. These are stripes down here. The ear is right in there. You can't see it, of course, but the big circles around each eye are the facial discs. And as Mark said, the call is distinctive. Uh, the classic call is woo hoo 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 but they can really mix it up. They'll go hoo or hoo 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 And I'm sure a lot of you are, have heard that. And in late spring and summer, they do what's called caterwauling. They'll go wah <laughs> you know, it sounds like there's a bunch of lunatics out there in the woods. Um, so uh, if you hear any weird sounds that you can't identify, chances are it, it's a barred owl. Now, to see how those facial discs help funnel sound into their ears, you can do an easy, quick exercise. You hold your hands up, cup them, and then put them behind your ears and you're extending your ears so you can pull in more sound. And that's what these feathers do around each ear. These facial discs focus the sound because they're cup shaped, those facial discs. They're not flat, but they're shaped like your cupped hand. And you'll notice that the barred owl has dark eyes. The barred owl is a little bit smaller than the great horned owl. So if you see a large owl, try to notice the eye color. And uh, whether there's ear tufts or not. Right. So great horns have ear tufts, barred owls don't. And uh, this bird is a female. We thought it was a male for about a year. And then we were doing a program for, I think it was third grade somewhere and she laid an egg. So the, <laughs> he became a she yeah. and um, they can live a long time. They can live 20 plus years. We don't know the age of this bird. Uh, so when it came in, it was an adult. So we have no idea of the age, but we hope to have her a good long time. And Marsha is going to move on to a bigger owl yet here. And this next owl nests in February, lays its eggs in February. Barn owl. Oh, sorry. Barn owls can lay their eggs any month of the year. I was thinking the great horn was coming out, but it's the barn owl coming out next. And in Massachusetts, it's a rare bird. It's the lucky birder that gets to see one. Your best bet to see one is on in uh, Martha's Vineyard or Nantucket. Um, but if you go down to Florida or Texas or California, um, there's many more barn owls down there. They, they're a warm weather bird. Uh, here at the northern edge of their range, they don't do well on these cold winters that we have. Um, but barn owls are beautiful. They hiss and they screech and they scream. Um, they typically live in old buildings here or in boxes that people put up for them. And certainly out on the vineyard, um, that's the case. Many of them are in boxes out there, but it's a lovely bird. This is a, a female barn owl. And, oh, did she hit you there? No, she didn't. Okay. And the female barn owl has nice tawny coloring on the upper chest and spots on the chest, whereas the male would have far fewer spots, if any at all. And, uh, how does this bird sound? They also have a blood curdling scream that goes right through you. Sounds like rubber tires squealing on pavement. But um, barn owls, as Mark mentioned, are found around the world on six continents. And so when people around the world think of owl, a lot of times they are thinking of an owl that looks like the barn owl with that classic monkey shaped face, heart shaped face. And I'll try to get you- Her back? Yeah. Looks like the night sky. Yeah. Was little uh, triangular spots on the back. Look like night stars against the beautiful sky. This bird is 13 years old, was hatched in captivity. And we were able to adopt her when she was 10 days old. Uh, she, was the offspring of a couple of education birds. And uh, so when, when birds or, or animals hatch or are born in captivity, chances are uh, a lot of times they can't be re released to the wild because they've been raised around people. They're imprinted on people. Right. Yeah. 
Now, so. um, we have her brother as well. Uh, we do keep them separate in separate cages, aviaries. Th these birds are all housed in our backyard in a fenced compound. Mm -hmm. Uh, we're, we're not open to the public. So when they're here, this is their rest time when they're in their aviaries. And we have to have federal and state permits to keep them. And the federal permits have cage requirements and all of our cages are larger than the federal minimum requirement. So uh, it's a big investment in materials and labor and you know, feeding them is expensive. We spend almost a thousand dollars a month on mice. Um, we don't feed them wild mice because you never know if someone has been poisoning the mice. So if there's one thing I want you to take back from this program tonight is to not use rodenticides to kill rodents if they're in your house. Instead, you can use a snap trap, good old fashioned mouse trap, and you set this, bait it with peanut butter, and when the mouse comes in, it kills the mouse immediately, no suffering. Rodenticides are a long, slow, painful death for a mouse or a rat. They cause internal hemorrhaging. And if a, if a owl or a fox or a, a hawk eats that poison rodent, that poison goes right up the food chain into that raptor or coyote or fox, and it could cause their death, long, slow, painful death. So rodenticides are bad news. Try not to use them. Use snap traps, it's a, or you can live trap the mouse and take it away from your house, but don't use poisons. And uh, this next owl that we're going to see actually was a victim of rodenticide. Uh, this is a great horned owl that was recovered down. Do you remember what town it was found in? It was in Middleborough, Mass. Okay. And you want to uh, stay standing for him? Sure. Okay. It was, um, he was found down on the ground, unable to fly. I try to get him to face the camera here. Okay. And, uh, the animal control officer was contacted in Middleborough and they were able to capture the bird and bring it to New England Wildlife Center in Weymouth. And they quickly realized that the bird had a broken right wing. I'll try to get him to face you there. <laughs> and uh, the bird was starving. So they did some blood work, they, they fed, fed the owl and they quickly realized that he had ingested rat poison or mouse poison, rodenticide. And so what they did, in addition to feeding him as much as he wanted to eat, uh, was they gave him vitamin K and that helped rid his body of the rodenticide. So he quickly put on weight. Of course, he does have a broken wing so he can't fly. And so he'll have a nice long life here with us. We, right now we have two great horn owls. The other one is my, my original great horn owl and he's 26 years old. And uh, again, when I was growing up, my mom used a great horn owl in her programs and that great horn owl lived to be 43 and a half years old. So generally speaking, the larger the owl, the longer they can live. You can see his pupils are very, very small because of our lighting in here, but uh, they're, they're incredible hunters. Also, they can occur in almost any kind of habitat, everything from our mixed woodlands to rainforest to cliffs, uh, and they're found only in the Americas, in North, Central, and South America. So they're really a wide-ranging owl in the Western Hemisphere and can uh, occupy almost any kind of habitat. They're often called the tigers of the woods. They have really big, strong talons and toes. And of course, you can see that sharp beak and uh, they're, they're excellent hunters. So uh, they generally speaking do not have natural predators. And in fact, there are accounts of great horned owls taking over a bald eagle's nest uh, up at Lake Umbagog. And uh, so the, the eagles, of course, can't see in the dark. And so some enterprising great horned owl decided to go for it. This bird weighs about three and a half pounds. And uh, he's doing a great job here. He's, he's very, uh, he's been through a lot of trauma. And so what we do when we adopt a bird is 
we just work with them and try to tune in to what they've been through uh, with their injury or uh, their background and to earn their trust. And uh, this is an owl that could eat uh, skunk, woodchuck, could take a small cat or small dog. So if you have a small pet, be aware that great horned owls are capable of preying on some pretty large, even if they can't lift a five pound animal, they can kill it. And the, the call of the great horned owl is a classic owl call. It's a four note call. Sometimes it's low. And then maybe back in the woods, you might hear a higher one. And then maybe the lower one might answer. Ooh, ooh. And you, you can often hear that in February, March, April uh, on a very, very still night. And it's just magical. Uh, it never gets old. So with that, once Mark gets back here uh, in the studio, I am going to go out and get our last owl. So this is going to take a moment. Well, Marsha puts the great horned owl back in his carrying box, and then we're going to bring out a surprise guest. Um, I'd like to answer a question while we're waiting for the next owl to come out. Uh, Eugene or Gino had a two part question. He wrote, I am a first year birder and having a blast. What is the one thing you would su suggest I do to begin to focus on owls? A, is it location? B, is it habitat? C, is it time of day? D, is it a field guide or app that I need to acquire? And Gino, the answer is yes to all four things. Um, location is habitat. You need to go to where the owls are. You need to learn what their habitats would look like. And time of day, the time to see an owl is daylight. The time to hear one is usually at night. So even if an owl is not active during the day, you can often get a look at it roosting. Um, so you might want to try going to Plum Island this winter and looking for other photographers and birders. And a lot of times you can see a snowy owl on the marsh or up on the dune line that other photographers or birders have spotted. And even if you can't get too close to it, you can observe it, try to learn about its habits. And you'll want to have a telephoto lens, Gino. Um, I'd say 400 millimeters is about as short as you want to go. 500 millimeters is better. 600 millimeters is great. 800 millimeters, well, hey, you won the lottery. Um, so long lenses are the deal. You need to use telephoto lenses. And then he wrote, how can I begin to photograph owls when they seem to be most active at night? Well, start with the nocturnal owls later. Go for the diurnal roosting owls. You can get screech owls up in cavities during the day. Uh, you can get snowy owls sitting out on the marsh, salt marsh or beach. You can get short-eared owls sometimes hunting in late afternoon. So don't worry about trying to get them at night. That's going to be challenging. Daytime is the best time to try for them. And you'll have a better chance of seeing them, obviously, during the day than you will at night. Nighttime photography is difficult. And you don't really want to use a lot of flash because that pulsing light can temporarily blind an owl and it might crash into things. So flash is not a great option. A lot of the night photos I took use continuous light. I use LED lights. And that way it's not flashing in the bird's face, uh, causing it to um, you know, perhaps crash into things. So um, I didn't know Janie or Mark, if we had other questions uh, we could take while we're uh, waiting for the special guest to come in. Um, Janie and Constance, feel free to ask. We have a few uh, in the question box. Okay, uh, this is Constance. Uh, I do have some questions here. One of them is, what is mobbing and why do birds do that? Well, mobbing is when small birds, usually smaller birds, will come in and harass a small owl or crows will harass a great horned owl or a barred owl. And they're trying to drive the owl out of their area because they know owls can prey on them. So if you hear excited birds, that's your key to look for either a hawk or an owl getting mobbed by these birds. So crows will mob hawks and owls. Uh, 
Crows will also mob ravens. Crows will mob eagles. But some of the small birds like kinglets, warblers, vireos, titmice, chickadees, nuthatches will mob sawwet owls and screech owls. In fact, at our aviary right out back here, a lot of times titmice are sitting right at the edge of the wire cage and they're voicing their displeasure at the screech owls that are sitting there in the sun. They're trying to mob them in their own cage. Um, of course, they can't get to them. The screech owls just look at them and say, yeah, yeah, right, buzz off. But in the wild, you can use that behavior to key in on where you might find a hidden sawwet or screech owl. Sometimes they'll mob an owl down in a hole that you can't see, and you'll see the birds peeking in the hole down at the little screech owl that must be tucked down in there. That was a great question. Excellent. Um, Go ahead, Danny. Yeah, so here's someone that's um, been hearing owls in the evening but never gets to see them. I think this is an experience many of us can relate to. And what are your recommendations for getting a view of some of these owls that are not all that far away from us? Well, if it's the winter and not the breeding season, you can try a brief call playback or imitate the call by mouth. Um, so if you, it's particularly easy to do great horned owl and barred owl. And you might get a response. And if you're really lucky, you can call that bird in and it will land in a tree above and be looking down at you. And if you have a, a small LED flashlight, you can click that on and get a view of the owl. I wouldn't do it during the breed nesting season, but in the late fall and winter, it's good times to do it. All right, I think Marsha just came in with the, with the other guest here and she's making her way over. And I am gonna back up and let her have some space here. So, who is this? Well, we all know who this is. It's a beautiful snowy owl. And uh, he was out there waiting for his supper. Um, but uh, this snowy owl is a male and he was captive hatched. He hatched in a, a wildlife park uh, out of the country, and uh, he was raised to be an education bird. You'd never get a wild snowy owl to sit and do this. So we've worked, worked with him extensively. You can see all of the adaptations that snowy owls have for living in cold places. He's got a face full of feathers. He's almost got a mustache going there. And look at his feet. You might think that that is fur on his feet, but everything on a bird is a feather, very, very specialized feathers. And in fact, at this time of year, snowy owls grow more, grow their foot feathers more thickly so that they'll actually wrap underneath the foot. Now, he actually does have little tiny ear tufts, but some snowy owls put them up and some don't. He usually doesn't, so I'm not sure if you can see that there. But uh, snowy owls, of course, are one of everybody's favorites. Uh, they have pointed wings as opposed to rounded wings. Try to get him to put his wings out there. And uh, I'll turn him around so you can see his back. He is four and a half years old. He's getting whiter and whiter every year when he molts during the summertime. And uh, so he's, he, he would be a, a pretty uh, successful male probably. Uh, Mark, can you share with us that information about males? Well, males generally get whiter as they get older. And um, so the Older males are the ones that breed in the Arctic. The younger males typically won't breed for several years. And uh, the, most of the birds we see here in New England are young birds. They're one or two years old. Uh, they're not the pure white males that are up in the Arctic breeding. Uh, so the birds we see are pretty dark. Females tend to be darker than males, although there is some overlap. And the only real way to tell a male from a female down here in the winter is to look at the fourth secondary and if the marking on that secondary touches the vein, the dark marking, it's a female. And if it doesn't touch the vein or if it's absent on the fourth secondary, um, that's a male. 
and you'd you'd want to do that in a photograph. You a high speed it, photo of a flying bird would be the best way to accomplish that. Yeah. And uh, but you know, in the Arctic, a pure white male is obviously he's he's pure white. It's a male. You can tell easily. Whereas the females are much darker, and they often get quite dirty when they're on the eggs incubating them because it's windy in the Arctic. And they often get quite soiled. Now, remarkably, not all snowy owls do migrate south. Some of them stay in the Arctic all winter. And it's not totally dark up there. There's starlight and moonlight, um, but it can get extremely cold, very, very low temperatures, 40, 50 below. And that's not counting the wind, which the wind in the Arctic any time of the year can be pretty fierce. Uh, so they are definitely built for the elements. Uh, when we first went to the Arctic in 1995, um, I could tell that it, it just seemed like the, the snowy owls filled the niche, the same niche that great horned owls do in this kind of habitat. So they really are dominant in, in the habitat, they virtually have no predators. And they're closely related. Right. Recent to DNA work, uh, the original genus of this owl was Nyctea, Nyctea scandiaca. And about, I don't know, 10 or more years ago, they reclassified it as Bubo scandiacus. And great horned owl is Bubo virginianus. So they're both Bubos, meaning they're closely related. It's B-U-B-O. Yeah, so uh, it makes sense. So, Mark, unless you have anything else to add. I'm going to go over and take a few questions. Okay, sounds good. Okay. He's doing a great job. So, I, uh, I didn't mention, I should have shown this earlier. This is a nesting box. Maybe you can scoot to your left a little, Marsha. This is the type of nesting box you can put up for screech owls. A barred owl box would be a little bigger, quite a bit bigger with a nine inch hole. The screech owl box has a three and a half to four inch hole. You can get free plans online if you just Google screech owl birdhouse and uh, they're easy to build. You can make one with 10, 10 bucks of scrap lumber or you can buy them all made for about $50. Um, and that's a snowy owl expressing his displeasure. Oh, he just hooted. You probably got to hear that. So, um, Constance or Janie, are there more questions we could get to in, in a few minutes here? Uh, someone would like to know how much the snowy owl weighs. Well, um, he weighs, what, about three pounds, Marsha? Three, three and a half. And a female could be up to five plus pounds. So males are smaller, as in most, most owls, males are smaller, although the smallest owls that's not always true, but with medium and big owls, females are usually bigger. And a big female could be five plus pounds. The great horned owl we had out was about the same weight, three, three pounds. And uh, the screech owl we had out was about six ounces. The sawwit owl was about three ounces, three or four ounces. So their weights are, um, they're not as heavy as they look, that's for sure. They have a lot of feathers, so they look a lot heavier than they actually are. And when, when you think about it, sorry, uh, birds don't weigh very much because they're covered with feathers, which don't weigh much, and they, most of their bones are hollow. Okay. Do we have a next question? Another question? I have a question here. Someone, Rebecca Soderman, is asking, are they sentimental, expressive, or cuddly? Well, they're, ex they're certainly expressive. Uh, I don't know about sentimental. Uh, Great horned owls uh, can attach themselves, I won't say emotionally, but they will bond with one person typically. And uh, that's the case with our 26 year old great horned owl. Yeah, he loves Marsha and he hates me. Uh, <laughs> and other people that have had great horned owls in captivity uh, have experienced the same thing. Uh, so they they have they form a very very strong bond with either another owl or the the person in their life. We have a, an imprinted American kestrel who happens to love me and hate Marsha. So 
she was taken from the nest as a baby and illegally raised by somebody and became imprinted. And that's, you know, we adopted her, but mm -hmm. yeah, she, she puts up a great stink if Marsha tries to pick her up, but if she, I pick her up, she loves it. Yeah. So go figure. <coughs> Excuse me. We have another question. Yeah. There were some couple questions relating to if you've ever been attacked by an owl or the stories that you hear of people being attacked by owls. Can you shed a little light on, on that? I've never been attacked well, by an owl. It's something you don't generally need to worry about. Although in the Arctic, the exception would be snowy owls. If you're near the nest, the male will often defend the nest and he'll come flying at you. And if you forget to duck, he's going to rake your head with his talons. So it can be um, in the Arctic for sure. It's dangerous to be around a snowy owl nest. Uh, you got to have your wits about you and it's best not to be near the, the nest to disturb them. And that's why I worked out of a blind uh, in the Arctic when I was near the nests. But around here with great horned owls, you, it, you really have to tune into your environment because if you have a, a pair of great horned owls that's nesting near you, they're gonna defend their territory and they're young. There was a story of a woman in Weston, Mass, the town of Weston. She was riding her bike down the bike path and supposedly a great horned owl hit her from behind and knocked her helmet off. Um, that's rare. Uh, you don't hear that too often. Um, and there was a forest ranger back at the turn of the century, early 1900s, who had a fur, either a fur hat or a fur hood on. And a great horned owl came down, grabbed him by the neck and killed him. But that's fluky. That's, that's, a, that's a fluke. Pretty exceptional. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you, you, we don't want you to be afraid of owls. Just be aware. And of give them. their nests space. Don't yeah. get too close to the nest. That way you won't get things too, uh, anybody too upset right. in the owl world. Thermal regulation. Is there a question about thermal regulation? There was a question from uh, someone about how they keep their burrows cool in hot climates. I think it's just being in the deeper in the soil that it doesn't heat up as much. Um, you know, if you dig down, the earth is cooler than the surface. And I think that's how they do it. And also, they're, uh, they'll sit out in the shade too, um, where it's a little bit cooler than it, obviously in the blazing sun. But it's, it's amazing that people can live down there. I was down in Yuma photographing those burrowing owls and it was 118 degrees in the sun. And that's not the, the sand temperature, that's the air temperature. The sand is hotter than that. Hmm. And I don't know how people live down there. They go, oh, it's a dry heat. And I go, yeah, so is my oven. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know how people live down there. I really don't. I'm, I'm a New England guy. I like cooler weather. Uh, thermoregulation, the young, young owls can't thermoregulate until they get um, two or three weeks old, particularly snowy owls. So the parent, the mother, uh, will brood them and keep them warm in that cold summer Arctic environment. Um, but a young chick can't thermoregulate yet. It takes them a couple, two to three weeks before they develop that thermoregulation uh, and able to maintain their body temperature. I think we have time for a couple of more questions, uh, but keep in mind that those of you uh, whose questions we don't get to, uh, we will answer them. We'll, we'll get your questions. And get back to you by email. Right. And right. Um, we, we will promise to try to get to all the questions. Yeah. So what do we have? Take a couple more. Um, what about, where have been your favorite places to photograph owls? Um, well, it kind of depends on what type of owl you're trying to photograph. But here in Massachusetts, Plum Island is a good place to start. Um, the New Hampshire coast can be excellent for snowy owls. Plum Island, you can get short-eared owls and snowy owls, and occasionally maybe a barred owl. And if you're really lucky, a saw wet owl. Um, in the summer, I would say try your your local area, get to know your local habitat. And you can find barred owls, screech owls, and great horned owls right near where you live. Uh, great horned owls are found in every state except Hawaii. And screech owls are found east of the Mississippi in most states. Here in Massachusetts, we have a lot of screech owls. So put up a box or two, and you may get them nesting right in your yard. 
Sawwit owls in the summer are here in small numbers. They're a tough bird to find. They do nest on the Cape and Islands. Uh, they're a cavity nester, but um, photographing sawwits is very, very challenging. So try starting with great horns, bards, and screeches, the three that are non-migratory and local. And by the way, cemeteries are great places for owls, especially screech owls. Uh, cemeteries a, a lot of times have old mature trees with, with cavities with cavities in them. Mm -hmm. And they're just very peaceful places where there, there's generally not too much disturbance. So think about wandering through cemeteries like Mount, parks. Mount Auburn Cemetery uh, in Cambridge or your local cemetery. Uh, they're, they're very beautiful places and very peaceful places for screech owls and great horned owls and sometimes barred owls. And you can go on eBird, which is a database run by Cornell uh, University, Lab of Ornithology. In eBird, people post their sightings and it will kind of help you get to familiarize yourself where people are seeing different birds, including owls. Mm -hmm. So eBird can be a great resource. Now you don't want to be posting locations of owl nests because you don't want to initiate a flurry of people going to try to find a nest. But certainly you can post sightings of snowy owls in the winter and um, people do that in an eBird you can go on there and research the bird you were trying to find and uh, it's how I did some of the research for my book out in western U.S. and I also used written bird guides to find out the bird best bird areas to go uh, and then talk to other birders that you bump into uh, or other photographers and um, that's the best way to learn is to just keep talking with others and see what they're doing and where they're finding things. Do we have one one last question or? Well, there's a there have been several people who wanted to find out again how to get the book. Um, a lot of okay. wonderful compliments about your presentation and appreciation for the photography, which has been extraordinary, Mark. Thank and, you. And uh, so if, um, if you can, can we post an email address? Yeah. Uh, um, it's easy. It's an easy address. It's eyes on owls at earthlink.net. So it's E Y E S O N O W L S at earthlink.net. And email us and then we send us your phone number and we'll call you. Um, we can do credit card, but we don't want to have you email your credit card number because that's not safe. Um, and I have some a limited number of books available that we can mail and um, and personalize and I can personalize them. Yeah. Yes. You know, if you want to do it as a gift for someone or mm -hmm. it's it's marketed as a kid's book, but I've had many adults tell me how much they like it as well. Mm -hmm. So it's um, is I just put your email in the chat room so they can easily find it. Thank oh, you great. so much. Yeah. Well, we want to thank the Peabody Essex Museum and uh, ECOC for hosting our program here tonight. It's been a delight and uh, a learning experience for us. Uh, so we hope to be doing more of these virtual programs. And Mark Wood, thanks for your technical help in making this happen. And, Not a uh, problem. Normally we do hundreds of school programs as well as public programs. Uh, so contact us with your ideas or uh, what you're looking for and uh, we'll be happy to talk with you. Well, you did an amazing a job adapting something that you normally do in a <laughs> space with lots of people and your birds were very accommodating of the strange circumstances. Um, they haven't had their supper yet, so we have hootie <laughs> duty. We're gonna go out and feed them now. <laughs> yes, yeah, you better get on that. Um, so great to be with you both and um, we're looking forward to you doing lots more programming in this virtual terrain uh, while you're between um, being able to do this real uh, in on-prem, as people say. So, and, uh, so, so to your audience, one last word here. Tonight, it's kind of rainy, so it's not a great night to go out listening. But when it clears out over the weekend, go out and listen for owls. You may hear them. And if they if you do, try hooting back to them. And you may get a great horn or a barred owl answering you. And by the way, Mark has a second book coming out about the snowy owl scientist. That'll be out in the spring. Yeah. And it follows 
researcher Denver Holt around the Arctic tundra. And he's had a 27 year study of snowy owls that's ongoing and uh, I shattered him for five weeks. Yeah, so we have that to look forward to. Wow, well, we can't wait for that one. Thank you. Um, and so thank you again, Mark and Marsha for just an amazing experience and um, uh, wanting to let everyone know that we have our next ECOC uh, co-sponsored event with Pam coming up on December 4th with, with Jared Kyes. And he's gonna be concentrating on one of the areas that Mark was taking photographs of. So it'll be an opportunity to do a more, a deeper dive into an area that's, it's very rich in, in bird life. So um, best to all of you. Um, and uh, I hope the owls have a good supper, Mark oh, and Marsha. Yeah. And maybe, we maybe we'll happen. bump into you down at Plum Island. <laughs> oh, I hope so. That would be great. All right. Take care now. Thank you. Bye-bye. Good night, everybody. Thanks for joining. Bye.